Uh, my name is uh, Joel Jones Perez. I work at the PUCP in Peru, and it's my honor to be your webinar on physics today. Um, our speaker today is Mauricio Bustamante from the Center for Cosmology and Astroparticle Physics of the Ohio State University, uh, the SICA. Uh, he's a former master's student of the PUCP and later received his PhD uh, from the University of Würzburg in Germany. Uh, during his PhD, he also worked at uh, DESI. Uh, after his PhD, he moved to SICA where he is currently a postdoc working on theoretical astroparticle physics, uh, mainly cosmic rays and neutrinos. Uh, Mauricio's talk is titled Gamma Ray Bursts, uh, Sources of Ultra High Energy Cosmic Rays and Neutrinos. And of course, we are glad to have him as our speaker today. So before we begin, we remind you that you can be part of the discussion after the talk uh, by writing questions and comments using the Google Plus question and answer system, the Q&A system. And also on Twitter, using, using the hashtag uh, LAWOP, this one right here. Hope you can see. OK, so I'll leave you with, uh, with Mauricio. Uh, uh, they're, they're all yours. Let me. OK, and unmute you. Start sharing my, hello, I'm going to start sharing my screen now. Moment. There you go. Everybody see that? I guess so. All right, so <clears throat> uh, it's, I'm very, very glad to be here, to have been invited as a speaker for the uh, Latin American Webinars on Physics. And I'm going to talk to you about what I've been working on in the past few years, uh, which is mainly cosmic rays and neutrinos of ultra high energy coming from gamma ray bursts. Um, so let me start by talking to you about two mysteries that are now 50 years old. Uh, the first one is ultra-high energy cosmic rays. They were first detected in 1962 um, as uh, very extensive area showers. Um, they were seen uh, by detectors at ground level, Cherenkov, uh, well, scintillator detectors. Um, they come isotropically from all directions. They have the highest energies of any particle that we know of. Uh, we're talking about protons and uh, nuclei that have uh, kinetic energies of joules to tens of joules. Um, and we see them regularly, even though they're quite rare. Uh, however, 50 years after their discovery, we still don't know where they're coming from. We know that they must be extragalactic because we see nothing within our own Milky Way that could produce them. Um, and we have some ideas of what the characteristics of the sources should be. But we don't really know how they are uh, accelerated to these very high energies. And on the other hand, there's gamma ray bursts. Uh, they were discovered in the, in the late 1960s accidental, accidentally by the Vela satellites uh, that were looking for <clears throat> gamma ray emission from potential uh, nuclear explosions. Um, so they were looking for signals that lasted about one microsecond. And they found signals that lasted between 0.1 second and uh, 100 seconds or so. Um, they were coming not from Earth, but from uh, outside the Earth. They were not correlated with supernovae at that, at that time. They were not correlated with uh, the sun. So they concluded they, they had to be uh, extragalactic uh, phenomena. And now we know that they, they are. We have measured the redshifts of some of them. They are about one gigaparsec away. Uh, again, they are isotropically distributed in the sky. So uh, these are the most luminous transient events that we see. Uh, they liberate about 10 to the 52 uh, ergs per second during a burst of about 10 seconds. And I'm going to Later on, I'm going to show to you what exactly these numbers are in context. So it, it is natural to think whether gamma ray bursts could be the sources of the most energetic particles that we have seen, the cosmic rays. And uh, that is a mystery. We, don't, we do not know what the origin of the ultra high energy cosmic rays and GRBs is. And our hypothesis, uh, and the hypothesis of many others, has been that uh, GRBs are the sources of cosmic rays, of the ultra high energy cosmic rays. 
And in that case, the detection of neutrinos from gamma ray bursts would be the smoking gun. And our result is that, indeed, this connection is possible and testable, but the connection between ultra high energy cosmic rays, GRBs, and neutrinos is not as simple as we initially thought. Uh, so it's not as simple as we thought uh, up to a few years ago. Very well. Um, now the situation is even better. So if, if I had been given this talk uh, two or three years ago, I would have said that uh, we are very sure that neutrinos are there at the highest of energies, but we haven't seen them yet. And uh, now we have. In 2013, ISTUBE reported for the first time the detection of ultra high energy neutrinos. Uh, so the first ones uh, reach up to 2 PeV of energies, and they are named BERT and Ernie at about 1 PeV, and Big Bird, which is the highest energy event, at about 2 PeV. And there are a bunch of other Muppets at, at lower energies. Now uh, there are more events. There are about uh, 130 showers and um, about 10 muon tracks detected. And the number is still growing. IceCube is still taking data. So ultra high energy neutrinos exist, but uh, uh, we're even able to, to uh, deduce a astrophysical ultra-high neutrino flux, uh, which is the one that's shown as the black dots with the vertical and horizontal bars on this plot. They are clearly above the background, so we see that the, the, this is a clear signal. And in fact, the flux that can be deduced from this data is compatible with theoretical expectations of a, a neutrino flux of extragalactic origin, which comes from 1907 by Baxman and Bacol. So far, we think uh, we have seen that the per flavor flux of neutrinos is about 10 to the minus 8 GeV per centimeter square per second per steer radian. And uh, so, so far, so good. Um, and with the current level of statistics, uh, we see that the arrival directions of these neutrinos are compatible with an isotropic distribution. Even though in this sky map, it, it would seem that there is an excess, it is not really statistically significant. So far, there have been no point sources resolved. Uh, we have only seen a diffuse flux, uh, but searches are still ongoing, and we think that in a few years, we might be get lucky and actually see sources. Very well. So I'm going to talk to you about GRBs, as I said. And uh, it is now a good moment to justify why they're some of the best candidates for cosmic ray and neutrino ultra high energy sources. The first thing is related to what I said earlier. Uh, they have very high radiated energies between 10 to the 52 and 10 to the 53 ergs. Um, that's, in context, that's uh, a lot. So, and as you can see there, a hydrogen bomb puts out 10 to the 20 ergs. Uh, an asteroid that will destroy all life on Earth puts uh, in 10 to the 26 ergs. The Death Star would be able to produce 10 to the 40 ergs. The luminosity of the sun is 10 to the 33 ergs per second. A supernova has a luminosity of 10 to the 41 ergs per second. And a whole galaxy has a luminosity of 10 to the 45 ergs per second. Now, of course, uh, GRBs only last for a few seconds. So. Even though their uh, luminosity is high, their duration is short. Um, because of the way they are formed, uh, we believe that they have very intense magnetic fields of about 10 to the 5 Gauss. And these magnetic fields would be able to confine the protons within the source and other charged particles. And they would be uh, shock accelerated up to the highest energies that we need for them to explain the, the, the observed ultra high energy cosmic ray flux. The way this is done is called, uh, maybe you've heard about it, it's called Fermi acceleration. Uh, it's not an a linear acceleration in, a ma in an electric field, but it is a uh, stochastic acceleration that is uh, consists in the particles gaining a bit of speed every time they cross a magnetic stability, instability. Sorry. Uh, this goes on for a while, and eventually they, it builds up uh, a lot of energy. Uh, GRBs are also interesting from an experimental point of view because since they last uh, very little, 10 seconds, the, if we observe them, the background for neutrino detection is very low. And the main background is atmospheric neutrinos. So during 10 seconds, uh, the signal-to-noise ratio uh, is potentially high. Now, um, the problem is that experiments are getting very good at detecting uh, neutrinos. Of course, it's not really a problem. It's a problem for, for theoreticians. And uh, that means that they are starting to strongly constrain the simplest joint cosmic ray and neutrino emission models. And the solution, of course, is just that we need to build more realistic models. And that's, that's what we have done. 
All right, so what are GIBs? As I said, they're the most luminous explosions in the universe. They're brief flashes of gamma rays lasting from uh, fractions of a second to about 100 seconds, isotropically distributed, far from mass, about 1 gigaparsec away, uh, is the, where the main density of these uh, objects happens. Uh, rare, about 0.3 GRBs per uh, gigaparsec cubed per year occur in the local universe. And um, from the 90s, uh, especially from a, a dedicated experiment, satellite, satellite experiment called BATSI, we know that they come in two populations. Uh, there are short duration GRBs, which are the ones that last less than two seconds, and we believe them to be uh, coming from neutron star, uh, neutron star mergers or neutron star black hole mergers, and long duration GRBs, which are associated to especially energetic supernova called hypernova. Um, we're going to be talking more about long duration than short duration GRBs. Um, the way they work is that when the, uh, the long duration ones is that when the supernova happens, uh, the angular momentum is high enough, the matter will accrete in a, the newly formed black hole and uh, because of angular momentum conservation and because of the creation of very intense magnetic fields, jets will be uh, created at the poles of the newly created emitter. emitter. And if these jets are pointed towards us, uh, we will the, then we will see the GRB. Um, of course, we we're gonna we're gonna uh, see in the following slides that we think that not only gamma rays are created in the jet, but also protons and uh, neutrinos. Uh, what do they look like? Uh, I'm I'm always curious about this this faraway things uh, when they don't show a at least some kind of photograph. Of course, this is not optical. This is X-rays. But this is GRB 060218, as seen by the SWIFT satellite. On the left, you can see the before picture, uh, and on the right, the after picture. And you can see a small, bright blue dot uh, on the center of, of the uh, dashed circle. And that's the so what's called the afterglow emission of the gamma ray burst. The afterglow emission occurs when this jet reaches the interstellar medium and there's some x-ray emission. So that's one way to see the GRBs as well. Very well. So we know uh, what they are, or we think we know what they are, we think we know how they look. Uh, we want to know how they work, how this these, uh, particle emission occurs. And the current paradigm as to how they work is called the fireball model. And um, in the fireball model, we have a central emitter, which is, as I said, uh, a, a black hole uh, with a, or a supernova, sorry, uh, with uh, two jets. And uh, within the jet, there is a uh, stream of blobs of plasma moving at relativistic speeds. Uh, since each one of them has a different mass uh, and a different kinetic energy, that means they will be moving at different speeds. And when they collide, <clears throat> they will merge. And when that happens, particles will get uh, created and emitted. And that includes gamma rays, protons, or I should say cosmic rays, and neutrinos. Um, and we will see that the situation, this is, a, this is of course, a, just a, an illustration. The situation is a bit more complicated than this. Uh, particle emission of the different species of particles will be coming from the different stages of the jet evolution. But the main overall picture is this. <clears throat> the way it works, uh, the way the, the joint emission of neutrinos, cosmic rays, and gamma rays works is uh, it's quite simple in a, in a, um, in a first view. Uh, as I said, we have protons that have been accelerated to very high energies uh, because of stochastic acceleration. And the way this works is that uh, it's, it's such that it yields a power loss spectrum for the protons. That means energy to the to some power. Uh, this this power is usually around minus two. And uh, there's also a, a photon field at the at the source, which is believed to be quite high, um, so that proton photon interactions will be more um, will happen more often than proton proton interactions. So most most of the particles that we're going to be talking about are uh, coming from p-gamma interactions. Um, in a simplistic view of the, of the process, we can say that the main contribu contribution to the um, flow of particles comes from the creation of a delta resonance, 
which then decays, as you can see, into a, either a neutron and a uh, charged pion or a proton and a neutral pion. Then the, the charged pion almost immediately decays and uh, gives neutrinos of electron and muon flavor, uh, while the neutral pion decays into two gammas, which are uh, contributing to the gamma rays that we see at Earth. Now, um, the protons, of course, they, uh, they, they remain um, trapped by the magnetic fields inside the source, but the neutron created in the delta resonance decay is no longer trapped and can escape. And it will do that, and it will decay, beta decay, into a proton outside the source. These are the high energy protons that, uh, after propagating uh, through the photon cosmological backgrounds down to us, uh, we'll, we will see as ultra high energy cosmic rays. Now, this delta resonance uh, decay uh, channel is only one of the possibilities of, of uh, uh, secondaries in the peak uh, proton gamma interactions. Uh, there are more channels contributing to them, and uh, I will talk about these in uh, a couple of slides. Uh, as I said, they will propagate down to us, and we have to take into account uh, neutrino flavor mixing. And when that's done, we expect about uh, the same uh, proportion of each flavor of neutrino to arrive at Earth and also that uh, we would expect to see one neutrino of each flavor per cosmic ray detected. So there's a one to one to one to one ratio. Uh, this uh, simple model of cosmic ray and neutrino and gamma ray emission is called the neutron model because only neutrons are escaping the source. And it is now strongly disfavored by uh, experimental observations. Um, the first the first hit that the neutron model received was in 2012 by by IceCube. Uh, so back then, uh, IceCube was able to rule out a simple version of the neutron model. Uh, by a simple version, I mean an analytical version of how the neutrino flux looks like. Um, the way they did it was, is that they took a sample of GRBs, real observed GRBs. Uh, the first time they did it was it was about 100. GRBs, they calculated the neutrino flux expected from each of them uh, by normalizing uh, the neutrino flux to the uh, gamma ray flux that they observed for each one of these uh, bursts. Um, once they did that for, for, for every one of the sources in the sample, they had a stacked uh, flux uh, obtained by adding all of them, and then they assume that these 100 GRBs were representative of the whole population of GRBs. And they extrapolated uh, from these 100 GRBs to what the all-sky, all-GRB flux would look like. And this is called a quasi-diffuse flux. The quasi part is that uh, well, you're deducing this diffuse flux from a limited uh, statistic sample of only uh, a finite number of GRBs. And what they obtained is seen in this, in this plot. Uh, this is real uh, data, and uh, you can see two kinds of lines. The dashed lines are the quasi-diffuse flux, so the signal of neutrinos um, expected from these 100 GRB, oh, sorry, uh, deduced from these 100 GRBs, and the solid lines are the upper limits obtained by the same experiment in the same configuration by IceCube. As you can see, the, the uh, signal is already at this point above the upper bounds. So they concluded that the neutron model of neutrino emission was uh, disfavored by the data. Um, and I said this was the first hit that the neutron model received, uh, but it was not a killing blow. Uh, what they had managed to do is rule out a simple version of the neutron model. Um, but if you take a a bit more care in doing the calculation of the particle emissions without bringing in any new physics, uh, it turns out that the conclusion is drastically different. The neutron model is not really, was not really yet discarded at that point. Um, the way uh, my group back then did it is uh, with the, our own particle emission code called NUCOSMA. NUCOSMA stands for uh, Neutrinos from Cosmic Accelerators. And NUCOSMA is a numerical calculator of uh, neutrino spectra, not only from GRBs, but in this case we apply them to GRBs. And it takes in two ingredients, the proton density at the source and the photon density at the source. What NUCOSMA will do is 
uh, let the protons and the photons interact and get the neutrino spectrum out of that. Um, for the proton spectrum, as I said, uh, the, the, the shape is a power law with a high energy cutoff at some maximum energy you can see as EP max there. And this shape is coming again from stochastic or Fermi acceleration. And the maximum energy, EP max, is determined by a competition between energy loss processes, which includes the synchrotron losses of the protons in the magnetic fields, uh, the adiabatic energy loss of the proton just due to the fact that the source is expanding, and um, energy loss coming from photohadronic interactions, so photon-proton uh, interactions. Uh, on the other hand, the photon density at the source is assumed to be a broken power law, as you can, th as you can see there. And the, the justification for this is that uh, this is the kind of uh, photon spectrum that is seen uh, for GRBs at Earth. So we assume that it has the same shape at the source, of course, taking into account uh, uh, the change in the reference frame, uh, both in redshift and uh, in the Lorentz boost. Very well, so um, we connect our calculations to observations by normalizing the photon spectrum to what is observed. What you can see in the first, in the first expression there is uh, the, the integral is, is yielding the total energy density in photons. Uh, and this is, for each GRB, this is uh, required to be equal to the uh, observed Isotropically, isotropically equivalent energy. That's a, a complicated name uh, for the energy deduced from the observation of one GRB under the assumption that the emission of the GRB has been uh, isotropic, so spherical, instead of beamed. That uh, does not, in, even though that's not a re the real case, that does not introduce a, an error because the, the beaming factors uh, eventually cancel out in, in the calculation. And the uh, denominator uh, shows V iso. V iso is the uh, emission, the volume of the emission region. This is where uh, particles are being generated. And that can be deduced also from the observations. If you, um, when, when a GRB is uh, detected, uh, what is recorded is called a light curve. That's the way the luminosity of the GRB is changing with time. And this light curve has a very fast variation. It has uh, small peaks and, and, and troughs that change in, in the time scale of the order of 10 to the minus 2 seconds. And from that, one can deduce that the size of the emitting region has to be about uh, 10 to the minus 2 seconds wide. Um, and from that, one can deduce it's the, the volume of the, of the emitting region. So that's the way this is done. We're normalizing our calculations to the observations of the gamma ray output of the GRB for photons. For protons, it's uh, just the same thing, but there's an extra factor. It's called the baryonic loading. And it, this is simply the ratio of the energy in protons to the energy in electrons and photons. Um, and this is uh, currently a, an unknown number. And it is usually assumed to be 10, because uh, that number doesn't mess things up. However, uh, in a, I will show you later on that we are able within our own model to uh, deduce this number also from uh, current observations of cosmic ray and neutrino uh, data. All right, so once this is done, once these proton and photon uh, densities are normalized, new cosmic calculates the neutrino uh, flux coming out from, coming out from that uh, just by convoluting both of them and a response function. The response function is the part that has all the particle physics in it. Uh, it has multiplicities, cross-sections for uh, several different channels. That includes the delta resonance that I showed a few slides earlier, but also extra uh, neutrino production modes like uh, kaon uh, production modes, uh, pi minuses, uh, neutron production modes, multi-pi in production modes. Uh, also takes into account the synchrotron losses of the secondaries. Remember, we're in a very high magnetic field environment. The, the adiabatic cooling due to the expansion of the, of the jet, and also takes into account that the protons are interacting with the whole photon spectrum. That was something that was not done 
before. Before, it was assumed that the protons were only interacting with the um, photons that had the maximum energy. And that was introducing some, uh, some errors in the calculation. And finally, it also takes into account flavor transitions for neutrinos. And you can see in the, in the plot on the uh, bottom right corner, um, if we had only taken into account the delta resonance for the calculation of the neutrino flux, which is what is shown in the y-axis, uh, we, we would have got the, the purple curve. And uh, each one of the different extra channels is adding up to the normalization of the flux and also to the shape. The most important contribution, actually, it comes from multi-pion production, uh, which is tilting the whole spectrum at about 10 to the 7 GeV. So once New Cosma was, uh, was running, uh, we took the same 100 GRB sample that IceCube had used initially for its own analysis with the same parameters and calculated um, the associated neutrino flux from each of these GRBs, but now using the numerical new Cosma calculation. And again, we deduce from that a, a quasi-diffuse flux. And as you can see on the right plot, um, the, the black solid line is the new prediction uh, of the quasi-diffuse flux of neutrinos. And it is now below the, uh, the upper bounds, which are labeled IC40 and IC40 plus 59, which is another configuration of IceCube. So the, the neutron model, uh, which actually is what New Cosma is still running, uh, was not discarded at this point. Uh, a, a more sophisticated or, or more detailed calculation, uh, bringing only just more particle physics but nothing new, was giving a drastically different answer. Um, so. Uh, we had started then changing the predictions for the neutrino flux at this point, and we wanted to know what would happen next if we also changed what was going on with the cosmic rays at the source. And at this point, we were only assuming, as I said, that the neutrons were escaping and the protons were staying at the source, uh, trapped by the magnetic fields. But then we allowed protons to leak out, so magnetic confinement was not perfect anymore. And um, let, me, let me skip... Uh, in this uh, in detailed explanation of these plots, but what I want to say is that since protons can now leave the source if the photohadronic interactions are not too intense, that means that these protons won't be generating neutrinos in the source, but will be leaving the source and free, free streaming basically out of it without generating neutrinos. So uh, depending on the conditions on this, of the source, depending on the density of the source, uh, on the densities of the photons and the, and, 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 the, and the protons in the source, we could get uh, more or less neutrinos just from the fact that protons can now escape without creating neutrinos. And what happens is that uh, um, we have two different scenarios. Uh, we have optically thin sources and optically thick sources. Optically thin sources are those where protons are able to, to leak out without interacting and creating neutrinos. Those are the one that look like the picture on the left. Um, the, green, the green curve here corresponds to the protons leaking out of the source without interacting, while the blue curve corresponds to uh, neutrons escaping from the source, like in the normal neutron model. And you can see there a, an orange flux of neutrinos, fluence of neutrinos, um, which is quite low in the left plot because the uh, protons are not uh, contributing much to the creation of neutrinos. Whereas on the right plot, for an optically thick source, protons are uh, interacting quite a lot in the source. And therefore, uh, the neutrino flux is much higher, as you can see there. So um, we took that into account. And uh, I want to talk to you briefly about propagate, propagating these uh, signals from the source to us. Uh, of course, there's three stages in, the, in, the, in this game, the, the emission at the source, the propagation, and the detection at Earth, uh, both of uh, gamma rays, neutrinos, and protons, or cosmic rays in general. Um, uh, let's talk about propagation. And of course, uh, the universe is expanding, so we have to take into account that the energy at production time is a factor of 1 plus z higher than the energy that we detect at Earth. Uh, 
but that's not all. There are also cosmological photon backgrounds, like the cosmic microwave background. There are also uh, optical and infrared backgrounds. And the protons, uh, while they're propagating, they will interact with these, uh, these photons. And when they do, they will create new neutrinos in a similar way in which that happens at the source. But now we get uh, neutrinos of a higher energy. Uh, they are called cosmogenic neutrinos. Um, so we have now the prompt, neutrino, the prompt neutrinos, or the neutrinos from the source, and the cosmogenic neutrinos that are created during propagation. Um, gamma rays, on the other hand, while well, they are generated with very high energies, they will uh, interact with the photon backgrounds and uh, via pair production and inverse Compton scattering and create a, a shower of electrons, positrons, and photons that will be uh, degraded in energy as they travel along, and they will finally be detected at, by experiment like Fermi-LAT and a lower G energy uh, regime, uh, the GVTV regime, uh, not the 10 to the 21 GVs. Uh, sorry, 10 to the 21 EVs. Um, as I said, the, the, the protons are uh, very energetic. We're talking about 10 to the 21 EVs in this case. And at these, at these energies, even though there could be magnetic fields between galaxies, uh, the propagation of the protons is, is basically ballistic. They won't be deflected much. That is a, is, is a big if, because it depends also on uh, what the uh, particular trajectory of the protons is. If they cross a uh, galaxy cluster, it's, they might actually go through a high magnetic field region, and then our assumptions would break down. But as a first uh, assumption, uh, it is a good one that they won't be deflected by magnetic fields. They will lose energy, though, on the uh, photon backgrounds by pair production, by electron positron production. And also, they will interact uh, via photohydronic interac interactions, as I said, and will create a cosmogenic neutrinos. And finally, neutrinos, of course, uh, they don't interact uh, much at all, or at all. Uh, but they, we have to take into account the probability of uh, flavor change. And uh, we expect then, uh, for the most popular scenario of how they are created at the source, we expect that uh, at Earth they arrive in equal proportion of uh, each flavor. But this might be changed by exotic physics, the neutrino decay, Lorentz invariance relation, uh, et cetera. So um, if we do that, if we propagate protons uh, from the sources to us, and then we also take into account the evolution of the population of sources with redshift, um, we can calculate what the proton flux would be at Earth. And that's the left plot in this, in this case. And there, uh, there are three different uh, pieces of information here. The first one is the data, which are the black points and the, and the gray boxes. This is data from the high-risk uh, cosmic ray experiment. And then we see two, uh, two red curves. The solid one is the, uh, the cosmic ray proton flux, uh, which is calculated from sources that are mainly dominated by neutron emission, neutronscape. In, that is, sources where the protons are uh, magnetically confined in the source. Uh, whereas the dashed line, uh, this is the cosmic ray proton flux coming from, pro from sources where the protons are uh, the main contribution to the cosmic ray flux is they are leaking out of the source without interacting. And they correspond to the two different uh, fluxes of neutrinos on the right plot. Uh, now, you see here four different uh, neutrino uh, lines, uh, two in orange and two in blue. Uh, the orange ones are the neutrinos coming directly from the source, which are called the prompt GRB neutrinos. Well, the blue ones are the cosmogenic neutrinos that the protons generated while traveling from the sources to us. And as you can see, uh, the solid line for the prompt GRB neutrino is much higher than the, um, the, the dashed orange line for the same prompt GRB neutrinos. The difference here between these two lines is that for the solid one, we assume that the sources were emitting cosmic rays mainly by neutron emission, where the protons stay in the source and uh, interact with the photons and generate neutrinos, which is why the, the neutrino flux is higher, whereas the, the dashed line is uh, generated by the 
uh, under the assumption that the sources are allowing the protons to leak out without creating neutrinos. And that is why neutrino flux here is, is uh, lower, uh, considerably lower. Whereas for the cosmogenic neutrinos, it doesn't really matter uh, much. We only care that the uh, protons or neutrons are leaving the source. Very well. Um, I'm going to go a bit faster now, because uh, I think I'm running out of time. But uh, let me not explain in detail this, this busy plot, but uh, this model of propagation of an emission of cosmic rays and, and, and neutrinos can be fitted to the data, uh, both cosmic ray data and the neutrino upper bounds. And the result of doing this is that we can do two things. The first one is that we can already rule out a, a scenario where the uh, GRB neutrino flux is coming mainly from the neutron emission uh, model. So there has to be uh, a considerable amount of protons leaking out of the source. And the second thing we can do is we can um, already predict that if GRBs are to be the cosmic ray sources, they will have the, the jets that are being emitted by the GRBs will have to be very relativistic. So uh, what is allowed in this plot is the is, is whatever is not colored, so whatever is is, is uh, white. As you can see, uh, the regions that are white have uh, are associated to gamma or Lorentz boost factors of the jet of 300 and higher. Um, so uh, this is a, a, a bit tricky to attain in GRB jets because uh, if they are very relativistic, we have all other energy loss processes. But it is pointing out to the fact that the uh, the basic models of neutrino emission are well too basic at this point. So we 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 need to move uh, one step farther. And uh, this one step farther was. Uh, a more intricate simulation of how the collisions between the, the plasma shells within the jet is, is, is uh, taking place. So in this case, we assume, again, a, a central emitter. We put out a number of shells, of, of plasma shells, moving along the jet, each one with a different speed. There are about a 1,000 of them. They have different masses, masses sorry, and they collide at different points within the, the jet, while well, well, the jet expanding. Every time they collide, uh, part of their kinetic energy gets converted and radiated away as particles. That includes uh, gamma rays, uh, protons, and neutrinos. But they will collide not a, at one single point, which is the usual assumption of the GRB neutrino models, but at different points in the uh, in different stages in the jet evolution. And uh, the result of this, um, let me move to the next one. The result of this is that um, we can keep track of the uh, of, of what the proton, neutrino, and gamma ray emission is at different stages of the jet evolution. And uh, this is just to show you that we're keeping track of each individual uh, uh, collision and what the uh, particle emission from this collision is. So for instance, the left plot is showing the neutrino fluence from each collision. There's, there are three types of collisions in this case. The subphotospheric collisions are those uh, where the, the, the light, the gamma rays, are not able to leave the source because it's, it's too thick. Uh, then come the, those are the, the black dots. The, the red dots are those where neutron scape uh, is, is dominated, is dominating the cosmic ray emission. And the blue dots are the ones where direct proton scape are, is, is dominant. Um, we can also keep track of the maximum proton energy and the maximum gamma ray energy. Um, the main result, however, is, is the following. Uh, you can see here a plot of the fract the energy output of neutrinos, cosmic rays, and gamma rays. Actually, actually, it's the fraction of the energy output to the total energy output uh, as a function of the collision radius. So where within the jet the collision that is generating the particles is occurring at. And uh, the result of this uh, is that neutrinos are, are clearly dominating uh, the emission at low collision radii, about 8.5, uh, 10 to 8.5 uh, kilometers, and at the middle range, so uh, uh, halfway through the jet, uh, is where most of the cosmic ray emission is coming from, and only towards the end of the jet, where it is already faint and thin, is where gamma rays can escape. Um, 
this is interesting because uh, usually uh, only gamma ray observations are used to deduce what the neutrino and cosmic ray expectations of GRBs will be. And uh, since these different particles are coming from different parts of the, of the jet where different density conditions are taking place, then it, it might turn out that our usual way to deduce what the cosmic ray and neutrino expectations is, is wrong because we're basing that from uh, gamma rays which are occurring only in a particular place uh, in the jet. Very well, so we can get out of this also a uh, quasi-diffuse neutrino flux by assuming that this simulated GRB is uh, a, a prototypical GRB. Um, and what we get is a, we can, we can, we're able to deduce a minimal neutrino flux of coming from GRBs. It's a very low level neutrino flux at the 10 to the minus 11 GeV per centimeter square per state radian per second. Uh, it is. It will not be accessible to the current uh, ice cube detector, but it will be accessible with some luck to the next generation. Uh, it has some 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 interesting features. Uh, it is in, it is a very robust uh, prediction um, in the sense that it is independent of the many of the particle. Oh, sorry, of the source characteristics. Anyway, uh, I've, I've, I've tried to give you a broad overview of, of uh, what the status of cosmic ray neutrino emission from the GRBs are and why they might be an interesting candidate to look at. Um, as I said, the expectations of the neutrino flux uh, coming from GRBs, is, uh, they are low. We're not, we don't expect the diffuse flux that ICIP saw to be dominated by the, the GRBs. We expect them only to be contributing at a few percent level. Uh, however, that said, they are likely to be the first point sources to be resolved just because of the very high signal to noise ratio that we can achieve because of their very short duration. We will need next generation neutrino telescopes to do that, like IceCube uh, Generation 2 and NKM 3 net if it gets built. And uh, we will also get uh, the, the current and um, uh, upcoming cosmic ray detectors to get more uh, extensive cosmic ray uh, statistics. So uh, my guess is that the mystery uh, will not last another 50 years. We should be making very good progress in the following five or 10 years. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Mauricio, uh, for a very, very interesting talk. Now is the time for, uh, for questions. So first of all, let me remind you once again that you can ask your questions using Google's Q&A mm -hmm. uh, feature and using Twitter using the hashtag, uh, no, right? That's a no, right, even though it's no. Uh, so let's see. First of all, we'll have a questions um, addressed by, uh, by voice. So I don't know if there's any questions. Um, over here, Nicolás had a question. Right, so I have a question, Mauricio. Hmm? It's about the shell that you say that they propagate with different speeds. I was wondering why do you have this? Uh, yes, I, I think I heard. Uh, so why do they propagate at different speeds, right? Hi. Right. Nicolás? OK. Yes. OK, uh, right. So we don't really know what the emission process, we, we don't really know what the emission process of these uh, shells is. Uh, we have some guesses. Um, we think that the speed distribution of the shells is a log normal distribution um, because it, it, it is a good way, if, uh, that assumption is a good way to uh, reproduce what the light curves of the ERBs uh, look like in real life. Um, why do they have different speeds? It's because uh, they are created with different initial masses. So each one of these blobs is, uh, is, contains a different amount of baryons in it. And they are given a different initial kinetic kick by the, by the black hole. So it's, it's, a, it's a random process with, with, with some underlying distribution which uh, one can model. But it is intrinsically uh, stochastic. Okay. So we don't expect them to have the same the same speeds because that would be weird. Yeah. yeah. OK, thanks. Yeah. 
All right, so we could uh, address the questions uh, by, by Roberto Lineros, maybe? Yeah, I have a question, but uh, one is about the, your slide number 15. Okay, let me, let me go to that. Yeah. It, it, it's just a curiosity. 15, right? Okay. Yes. The one with the two plots. I can share that. Um, give me a moment. Yes, that one there. OK? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this cosmic rays from neutrons, these are all the species that are created from the neutrons. But it seems that this neutron does not contribute to, to protons, let's say. Or it's just them. I, 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 I Probably wasn't so. Let me let me explain it. Um, so the neutrons only live 15 minutes. Even if they are really boosted, they will decay. All of them will decay into protons. Uh, on once they leave the source. Um, I think your question is why aren't we seeing the neutrons also as cosmic rays at Earth? Yeah. Uh, yes. In the sense, if the neutron is High energy enough, it could last long. I don't know what is the distance that they could travel, but um, since they have a very big uh, Lorentz uh, factor, they could cover a very long distance without any deflection of any for like cross rays. For sure, for sure they they do that. Uh, I mean, they expect to have Lorentz factors of 100, 300, perhaps more. But that won't make them uh, travel the one or more gigaparsecs uh, from the uh, from the sources to us. They will decay, so they they won't reach us as neutrons. They will reach us as protons. Okay, and another question is: if you in this neutron model, you expect any spectral feature, or everything is smooth? Let's say. No, there there is there is actually. Yes, let me let me show you that. Uh, so let me go back to, to slide 13. And um, actually, no. Let me go back to my let me go to my backup slides. Um, I, have a, I have one that might be useful. Um, right. Uh, yes. So you, you can see here. Uh, what you can see here is the muon neutrino uh, flux at the observer uh, generated by the neutron this neutronscape model and um, there are three kinks um, uh, one at 10 about to 10 to the 5 GeV one at about 10 to the 7 GeV and, and, and one about uh, 10 to the 9 GeV each one of these corresponds to when the synchrotron losses of a different species of charged particle turns on uh, so the first kink is due to uh, the one at 10 to the 5 is due to the muon synchrotron losses turning on. The one at 10 to the 7 is due to the uh, pion uh, losses turning on. And the last one is due to the kaon losses turning on. So there are spectral features. Uh, at this point, um, they're, with the current statistics, they're, they won't be resolved. Uh, we need, I mean, in order to resolve the spectrum, we need on the on the order of, I'm I'm just I'm just guesstimating here, but the order of 100 events coming from a GRB, maybe maybe it's 50, maybe it's it's 40, but uh, we haven't seen even one coming from a GRB. We have only seen a diffuse flux, but certainly there are spectral features. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. Also, I have another one. Yep. Uh, okay. But it's, it's like, I guess it's just a comment if you can add, in the sense, uh, how different are the, 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 the relative size of neutrinos from GRB with the cosmogenic ones? I guess you already showed, but I guess it would be deserved to watch it again, the plot. Um, yeah, uh, I'll bring up the plot again. Uh, okay. So they are comparable in size as you can see in the right plot here you should compare the the green sorry the orange ones to the the blue ones on the right plot 
<clears throat> so let's let's focus just only on the on the on the solid lines, which are the neutrons. Sorry, the neutrinos come in from the assumption that the neutrons cape is dominating the cosmic ray emission. They they are at about the same normalization level. However, the cosmogenic neutrinos uh, are are at a higher energy. Um, so uh, we expect maybe the next generation of, of, of neutrino telescopes to be sensitive to the cosmogenic neutrinos, or maybe the, the current uh, non-Cherenkov uh, tel neutrino telescopes to be able to cosmogenics, just because you need a very large area to see, to see them. But they are almost at the same level of normalization. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, I don't know if there are any other questions. There is uh, a question from Miguel Angel. Uh, yes, I may, I may have a question for, for Mauricio. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you can hear me, I guess. Yes, yes. Yes, okay, yeah. So I miss, I'm mostly interested on, on, on the gamma ray connection uh, since I'm working for the, for the Fermilab. So mm -hmm. can you comment a bit more about you know what, what you can learn from from gamma rays uh, you know to, to test your 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 models your predictions and sure. you know, essentially I mean what, what we can do with uh, either the LAT or GBM at the moment? Of course. Uh, so let's see. Uh, as I said, the the gamma rays are created at the source with energies that are comparable to the cosmic ray and neutrino energies at that point. So 10 to the 19, 10 to the 20 EV. But they won't reach us at that level. So they will cascade down to, to GV, TV, to the GV, TV range at, at, at the point where they are detected at Earth, for instance, by Fermilat. Um, the models that we have used uh, don't propagate the, the, the spectra of photons from the sources to the Earth. But they, they do keep track of what the energy density uh, in electromagnetic content is. That, is. that is to say, what is the energy that's going into photons and, and, and positrons and electrons. And by the time they reach Earth, this energy density is still below the Fermi upper bound uh, that you can deduce from Fermi, Fermi light observations. So it is, it is, it is um, uh, satisfying that constraint. Um, and of course, uh, using the Fermi bounds is also a way to uh, limit how high the cosmic ray uh, the cosmic ray flux could be at the source. So on the one hand, we have that the cosmic rays have to fit the ultra high energy cosmic ray spectrum uh, measured at Earth. On the other hand, the neutrinos that are associated to these cosmic rays have to satisfy the the ice cube up bounds. And the third, uh, the third constraint is that uh, it cannot exceed the Fermi bound on the electromagnetic content in the local universe. And uh, we check that our, our models are not exceeding that bound. As a next step, what we want to do is uh, actually cascade down the photons down from the, from the sources to, to the Earth. But that takes a bit of you know, work. Uh, okay, thank you. So, so just just uh, uh, one more thing. So, when you say Fermi bounds, you refer to isotropic gamma ray background. Uh, y yeah, basically that's it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Okay, thank you. Yep. All right, we have uh, one more question uh, by Diego Restrepo. Mm -hmm. Please go ahead. Yeah. Mm. All right. So very heavy dark matter. Um, is it possible to differentiate a very heavy dark matter from astrophysical sources? Um, let me think for a moment. Well, there are, there are two two sides to that to that answer. Uh, let me start with the one I'm a bit more familiar with. Uh, there is uh, there is a class of models of of dark matter where uh, there's a heavy dark matter that uh, decays or annihilates into a lighter dark matter particle. So this is the, this uh, com composite dark matter models. And uh, if the mass splitting is, is big enough, then the, the light dark matter particle can be uh, can be coming out with a very high boost. 
uh, in that case, uh, if that uh, WIMP interacts within IceCube, let's say, it could very well mimic a, a neutrino. Um, so that's one side of, of things. The, the other side of things, uh, maybe you're referring, uh, when you're talking about very heavy dark matter, you're referring to annihilation to gamma rays. And in that case, uh, as far as I know, uh, heavy dark, very heavy dark matter could, in principle, give you a contribution to the, the, the isotropic gamma ray background and probably not at the highest energies where the sources are already resolved, but maybe in intermediate range. Um, but uh, coming back to the first part of, the, of, of my answer, well, yes, a very heavy dark matter could be contributing to the ice cube signals. There are a couple of papers about that. Okay, thank you very much, Mauricio. I yep. okay. guess that we do not have any more questions. Uh, so uh, let us, we, we, we thank you once uh, once again for, for your great talk. And I'd like to thank all our viewers also for, for watching. Um, so before, uh, before uh, finishing this webinar, I'd like to remind you all that uh, the fifth Latin American webinar on physics shall be in two weeks on the 22nd of April. And we shall have Alex Tapia from the SNEA, C-N-E-A-E-A, -E -A, in Argentina, speaking about the chemical composition of high energy cosmic rays with the Piero Ger Observatory. So, so that's it. Um, looking forward to seeing you all in, in two weeks. Thank you very much. Thank you.